What if I told you that one company could seize control of an entire country, contaminating its water supply with cancer-causing agents and eradicating the environment and millions of people's means of subsistence? A corporation that has complete control over the military of a large country and uses violence against protesters to further its goals. Well, Shell has been experiencing this in Nigeria. The largest royal families in the world own companies like Shell, which has effectively colonized an entire nation. They've created a strategy for businesses all over the world to overthrow government. This is a story that has received international coverage. It's time we had the conversation about propaganda, because if people knew the full extent of the story, there would be a worldwide chaos. So how did one company manage to rule a whole country? You must take a number of steps, I suppose. Choosing which country will be the target is the first and most obvious step in taking over a foreign country. Untapped resources must exist there, whether they be people, minerals or oil. It would be ideal to have all three, and it would even be better if these were the main sources of income for the nation. Whether it be solid bananas, diamonds, copper or oil, which is the most abundant of all. Second, the business must have the power to influence the government. Although force can be used to achieve this, financial influence over a nation is much simpler and more effective. Which nation meets these requirements, since no one will notice and everyone will benefit? Where could Shell find a country with untapped oil reserves and a military and government that were amenable to corruption? Well, it so happens that Nigeria checked off every single item on the list, making it the ideal nation. It was time to move on to step 2, which involved making Nigerian officials totally dependent on Shell. So how do you make Nigerian government officials reliant on a single company? Well, you need to manage their primary exports. The process was straightforward because this is oil in the case of Nigeria. Controlling the infrastructure for oil extraction was one of the main ways Shell would seize power in Nigeria. Shell would promise the Nigerian government, we will develop your country, give you tons of jobs and bring you tons of foreign investment. If we're allowed to build the infrastructure for oil extraction. And at first glance, this seems like a fantastic deal for the Nigerian government. Nigeria is a developing nation in need of foreign direct investment. As such, they want foreign businesses to improve Nigeria's infrastructure because doing so will increase investment, employment, prosperity, and tax revenue. It therefore seems like a win-win situation to have this large multinational company offer to develop better extraction techniques for your main export. Although all the infrastructure would be located on Nigerian territory, Shell would be the ones to actually own and manage it. And this did not come without a cost. This implied that Nigeria would eventually rely solely on Shell to maintain the operation of its approximately 1,000 oil wells. Since oil accounts for 40% of Nigeria's exports, and since Shell had control over the oil flow in the nation, they could now manage almost half of Nigeria's total cash flow. As Henry Kissinger once said, whoever controls the money controls the world. It was a brilliant business decision because Shell and any other oil company could completely halt extraction, decimating the entire country's economy. And because of Shell's strong connections to the British and Dutch royal families, as well as all the other major banks, Shell had an unmatched influence over the nation as a whole. They would then instruct other significant corporations to discontinue their investment in Nigeria, depriving the nation of everything and suffocating it. Shell also controls the oil distribution system, so even if Nigeria were to by some miracle succeed in taking control of the extraction process, Shell would still be required to export the oil out of Nigeria. Furthermore, since oil revenue accounts for more than 65% of the government's revenue in Nigeria, Shell is essentially the country's father. It's this reliance on Shell's infrastructure where the company can do whatever it wants and the Nigerian government is helpless to stop it that really resembles an abusive relationship. The economy would enter a severe recession if Shell stopped extracting oil, leaving the government helpless and insolvent. The Nigerian government was well aware that this issue would soon result in civil unrest and revolt. 
So, why is the Nigerian government acting so indifferently? Why did they allow this occur at all? This brings us to the third stage of controlling a nation, I suppose bribery. It was time for Shell to gain access to the government once Nigeria became reliant on them for oil. Shell previously transferred $1.3 billion to Nigeria, knowing that it would end up in the hands of convicted money launderers. According to an anti-corruption investigation, after receiving the $1.3 billion, various middlemen received the money instead of Nigeria. After giving the Nigerian president and his deputies $466 million of that, Shell was granted access to the OPL245 oil field, increasing the company's overall oil reserves by one-third. According to them, the EFCC is looking into whether the 2011 $1.3 billion purchase of OPL245 involved acts of conspiracy, bribery, official corruption and money laundering. Despite the mutually beneficial relationship between Shell and the Nigerian government, Nigerian citizens weren't exactly the target of the bribery. The majority of the populace was hit by an endless stream of oil spills instead of sharing in the nation's newfound wealth. At least 29 million liters of oil have been discharged into Nigeria as a result of nearly 3,000 spills that Shell has been blamed for since 2010. For comparison, this is sufficient oil to fill over 11 Olympic-sized pools. The country's water supplies are then contaminated by these oil spills. Therefore, the water that Nigeria consumes today is tainted with cancer-causing agents. The oil operations also contaminated the water supply and agricultural land, killing wildlife and destroying economies that were based on subsistence farming and fishing, says the United Nations. This takes away the nature of farming and fishing industries that many Nigerians depend on, causing the Nigerian people to become even more destitute and contaminated and increasing their reliance on Shell for financial assistance. The local population, as you might imagine, wasn't too pleased with these frequent oil spills, which leads us to step 4 in taking over a country, controlling the civilians. Shell has mastered populace control, though the specific strategies used may differ depending on the location. How did you manage to make a nation compliant with your wrongdoings? How could you make them happy drinking water that causes cancer and having their entire nation ruled by one corporation? Time was running out if they weren't able to maintain control of the populace quickly enough to prevent a revolt and the collapse of their rule over the nation. What did Shell do? It was urgent that a plan be developed. They however remained silent and denied any wrongdoing. All the four cases were sabotage, so not actually done by Shell, they were actually by criminals who steal products. In actuality, despite the increasing wealth and power it was extracting from Nigeria, Shell only admitted responsibility for less than 40,000 gallons of oil spills, or about 0.5% of the total amount, up until 2011. However, the denial of any wrongdoing was short-lived. Shell needed to behave like all good dictatorships, stifling any opposition with propaganda and using all of their resources. They planned to suffocate the populace using the money they extracted from Nigeria. Shell has long attempted to influence public opinion in their favor, but this hasn't always been done through conventional means. Shell would covertly fund a number of publications in the 60s that fanned the flames of civil war in Nigeria. The companies seemed to promise the Nigerian people resources that would be theirs after the war when it played both sides against one another. But all of that was just smoke and mirrors. Still, the agreement gave Shell complete command over Nigeria's oil. Today, however, the business has developed newer, more creative propaganda strategies. The ability of Shell's new propaganda to muddy the lines between truth and lies makes it effective. Leaks internal documents reveal Shell's true plan for refocusing the story and highlighting the environmental advancements they are making. Shell provides 100% renewable electricity to 1.4 million homes in the UK. Charities and NGOs were the company's first target market. Shell would divide groups into those that might support them and those that would never do so. Shell would then make an effort to influence the moderate NGOs by criticizing those aspects, 
which basically means that Shell would claim that they are making green environmental changes if any organization calls attention to their wrongdoings, while additionally paying NGOs and charities to turn a blind eye. Then Shell would concentrate on persuading foreign news agencies to support them. They would accomplish this by employing the same strategies they had with non-governmental organizations, but this time, they would also exaggerate the significance of criminals digging into oil pipes and causing the spills. They would make fictitious claims that Nigerian sabotage was to blame for 98% of oil spills, attributing the harm that Shell was actually causing to radicals and criminals in Nigeria. The blame is then shifted from Shell to the Nigerian people as a result of this news misdirection tactic. Although this propaganda was effective on a global scale, Nigerian citizens were unaffected by it. There was still a great deal of civil unrest in Nigeria, even though it was successful in publicly muddying the waters. People had grown tired of Shell destroying their environment, their jobs, and all of their resources while also depriving them of basic necessities and giving them cancer. The nation was changing, Shell was in serious trouble, and Shell's time was running out. They had to take immediate action. How were they going to silence the population? How were people made to be passive by force? Given that Shell was blatantly destroying the nation, this was a difficult thing to do. Fishing provided living for tens of millions of people. However, these ongoing oil spills were contaminating the coast and ruining Nigeria's fishing industry. There just wasn't enough bribery and propaganda. Consequently, we have reached the fifth and last phase of Shell's takeover of Nigeria. This was done to violently crush any opposition. You see, the Nigerian populace was on the verge of revolution at this point. Nigerians started to protest as they realized they had been colonized by a single company, and one of these protesters was Ken Sarawiwa, the leader of the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people. From the very beginning, even though I was young, I could see that nothing was coming to the Ogoni people from the oil. Shell's tyranny over Nigeria was challenged by this organization through a non-violent campaign, so it's understandable that Shell didn't very much like either Sarawiwa or this protest. Sort of pollution to live with it in an area where land is in very high demand is completely destructive of the community. In fact, to the point where Shell allegedly assigned the Nigerian military to carry out their dirty work because they were endangering its total control of the nation. You see, there had been about 7,000 oil spills that had harmed the environment of the nation during Ken Tarawiwa's lifetime. This is just one of the locations where Shell, an oil company, has wreaked havoc on the environment for decades. According to a UN report, cleaning up the mess will cost about $1 billion and take 30 years. Sarawiwa eventually had enough. He was sick of the Nigerian people becoming sick, poisoned, and impoverished, as well as of the environment collapsing around him. As a result, he organized numerous non-violent protests against the exploitation of Nigerian land, as well as the death of financial benefits for ordinary people. Shell was beginning to lose their hair over this, because they knew they could never agree to Mossop's demands, and that they would look bad if they took direct action to put an end to the protest. If Shell started suppressing dissent, charities and NGOs would no longer support the company. The global community would always avoid Shell. Shell may even receive a low ESG rating. Shell needed a middleman to handle their dirty work, and fortunately for them, the Nigerian military was more than willing to do it in exchange for juicy bribes. According to Amnesty International, the firm's executive encouraged a brutal crackdown to silence protesters in the Nigerian region of Ogoni land. Because of this, Shaw finally had enough after about five years of protest and ordered the detention of Sarawiwa and eight other tribal leaders. Despite the fact that the demonstrations were peaceful, the men were accused of planning a murder and later put to death by the government. Everyone knew Shell was to blame for this, so in an out-of-court settlement, the business agreed to pay a worthless $9.6 million. Normal Nigerian civilians' lives haven't really improved at all since the protest leader was chopped off. In fact, this has only served to strengthen Shell's hold over the entire nation, 
which is why radical dissidents have started taking their own action. Inadvertently giving Shell more justification to control the protests, groups outside of Nigeria have started sabotaging pipelines in Nigeria, causing even more spillage across the country. Additionally, a new militia known as the Movement for Emancipation of the Niger Delta kidnapped and held for ransom a number of the oil company's employees. Despite a ceasefire being declared in 2009, the situation didn't improve because the Nigerian government later declared an all-out oil war in the nation. Shell and the Nigerian government are fighting against the population's deprivation and poisoning. It will take a complete revolution to drive Shell out of Nigeria because of how close to a monarchy they have become there. Since the government and military are wholly controlled by Shell, third-party intervention is almost certainly going to be necessary. Furthermore, Shell shows no signs of slowing down anytime soon. Because of the escalating military conflict over the oil operations in the Niger Delta, whether it be through piracy, kidnappings, bombings or other insurgency, violence is prevalent in the region. While this is going on, Nigeria's resources are depleting day by day and the population is getting poorer and poorer. While doing so, the Western media applauds Shell for its progressiveness, commitment to the environment and efforts to halt climate change. Yeah right, Shell has effectively taken over total control of Nigeria. Yet, there's been no significant backlash in the West. So, emulating Shell's strategy isn't a bad place to start if a company intends to undermine a nation's economy. Who do you think is at blame for this? Shell or the Nigerian government? Let us know in the comments down below. If you like this video, kindly like, turn on the notification bell and subscribe to our channel so you won't miss when we post another video. Also share with your friends.